You are listening to the One Day at a Time podcast. On this podcast, my guests share their stories of alcoholism, addiction, and how they recovered so that you can too. My hope is that you find the inspiration and resources you need to let go of what's holding you back so that you can transform into the person you were always meant to be. Ready? Here we go. Have you been trying to change your drinking on your own? or struggled to stay sober in social situations or on vacation? Well, today my guest Deb Massner and I talk about some of the most common mistakes people make when trying to quit drinking and how to avoid them. Deb is the host of the Alcohol Tipping Point podcast. She works with people who find themselves in the gray area of drinking, where alcohol is taking more than it's giving. People in the gray area who recognize that it's time to change their relationship with alcohol. We also talk about drinking triggers, what a sober toolkit is, and how it can help regulate your emotions to make sobriety stick. Anyway, I'm really excited to share this conversation with you. So without further delay, please enjoy this episode with Deb and let me know what you think. Well, Deb, thank you so much for joining me. Thanks for having me. I I loved having you on my podcast and the conversation that we had about AA and the 12 steps and the rabbit holes we took. So I'm (laughs) excited to be on your show. Yeah, actually, that was a really good interview for me because we ended up talking about some stuff that I don't usually talk about. I don't remember what it was now, but I think we kind of chatted afterwards where I was like, wow, that was really good. You got some stuff out of me that I don't normally talk about, but gosh, I I listened back to the interview and I had to text you because I was like, oh my God, I was rambling. You asked me one little question. 10 minutes later, I was like, I forgot what you asked me. (laughs) Those are the best though, where you could just get in your groove and you're so passionate about it. I I thought it was great too. It was really, really interesting for me since I don't know that much about AA or the 12 steps. Yeah, that is like the mission I'm on. I've just come to this place where I've decided that I really am a 12-step advocate. I am very clear that there are some problems with it or some things that can be problematic that either prevent people from trying it or drive them away if they don't like go to the right meetings. Or I, I don't mean like go to the right meetings in the sense that it's their fault, but Every single meeting is different and people think that the way they do things at that meeting that they went to is how they're all run. Mm. And that is not the case. So, but, and there's a lot, I'm excited to talk to you today because um, of the way that you got sober, right? Like yeah, you got sober in 2020. Is that right? Yeah, it was a new year's resolution. <laughs> <gasps> and it's Stuck. January 1st, 2020. Ooh, girl, amazing. Yeah, there's it's so funny because the the 12 step rooms fill up a lot in January. That's when my podcast downloads are the highest. <laughs> I bet. I bet. Yeah. Yeah. That oh. is when that was my official day. Yes. January 1st, 2020. That's a that's a cool, that's a cool sober date. I like it. Any date is a good sober date, right? <laughs> yeah, but that one's kind of cool. <laughs> Mine was just like, right. yes, every every day is a good day to get sober. I have a friend that got sober. It was like, like it, it was either like December 31st. No, it was like right before like a major holiday. And they were like, why didn't you wait? And she was like, I drank as long as I could. <laughs> it was like just before St. Patrick's Day or something like that. <laughs> oh, too funny. Yes, we drink as long as we can until we can't any longer. Um, but I want to start off with a little lightning round game I like to play to front load the episode. I always wonder when I say that, do my long- longtime listeners get sick of hearing that? I don't know, but now I'm like nervous. <laughs> <laughs> I know I didn't prep you or anything. I like to be spontaneous. It's super okay. easy. It's actually okay. not. It's slow, so it'll be fun. Um, So when you got sober in 2020, there was a ton of like quit lit was already a thing and lots of books and podcasts already. Was there, was there a book that really stood out to you that helped you a lot in the beginning? Well, I mean, we'll probably get into it more if I talk about my story, but it was years of reading different books (laughs) then. (laughs) 
Um, so one thing that did stand out to me in January of 2020 is that's when I read Laura McCown's first book. Um, we are the luckiest. Club. Yeah. 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 We are the luckiest. And it wasn't even the book that was super helpful, but at the very beginning, she had her nine things and those nine things stood out to me. It, it just kind of helped tie it all together and that was the, it's not your fault. It is your responsibility. This is your thing. This sucks that this is your thing. Um, I think some of the other ones were like, you cannot do it alone. Only you can do it. And and it was just so powerful for me because it like married the two concepts for me of Yes, alcohol is shit for your health and a poison and marketing and we've been told a pack of lives, all of that. But it married it finally with like, and this is my choice. This is my responsibility. And so when I could put those two concepts together, that's what really made it stick for me. So I would say that book that those nine things that's what stood out for me when you were like was there something you read that stood out <laughs> but yeah. also keeping in mind there were years and decades of reading before that oh man i am an information gatherer so <laughs> I, I really relate to that there was some, there was some sort of dopamine hit where you read something and you're like yes like these mindset shifts like different ways of looking at things that really resonate to give you like that sort of like good feeling. Um, but then it was taking the action seemed to be, there seems to be like a, a knowledge action gap, which. Yes. Yes. It's like connecting your mind to your heart. Yeah. It's like, do like this, do something with this information. Like I tell myself, yeah, I need to do something with all this information that I'm, a, that I'm collecting. It's like, what's the point of gathering the information if you don't do anything with it well you know what's interesting you said the dopamine hit of gathering information I did read that you do get a dopamine hit when you're doing like trivia or answering questions correctly so when you're talking <laughs> about like oh when I get that like connection when I get it when it's yeah. right like you do get a little dopamine hit from that. Oh yeah, you do. Yeah. That's why I started doing a second podcast, the self-help junkie, because I am obsessed. Like, and you know how I justify consuming information? It's like, oh, then I'll use it to share with others. Right. But if I'm not actually applying it, then what's the point? Right. So the podcast is I talk about a topic, come up with three action items. And then the next week is, did I do the action items? Yes or no. If no, what got in the way? But if yes, what was the results? Because we're invoking the law of cause and effect, right? So I'm on a personal mission to apply what I'm what I'm learning. <laughs> That's really cool. That's a good idea. I love it. Yeah. You'll have to come on and be a, a guest co-host and and play along with me. It'll be fun. I would love to. Yeah. Yay. All right. See, I told you this was slow. So the second question, <laughs> you know, as you look back over the four years, do you see like a reoccurring theme or maybe there was a quote that you, that you really resonate with? I think the reoccurring theme is connection. Mm. I think fi finding people who get it um, and then the connection that I've built, like within alcohol tipping point, we've had a few retreats, in-person retreats where like we get together and just get to experience life on life's terms without alcohol. That has been amazing. And then the connections I've made through my podcast and meeting people like you, Arlena, and that has been really amazing. So I think that's I guess what stands out to me in the last four, four and a half years is just connection. Yeah. I've heard that, uh, alcoholism is a disease of isolation and connection is the cure, mm. right? It's like that, that terrible, I don't know that people that suffer with addiction issues really suffer from loneliness, right? Yeah. Like they're really affected by it. And the connection seems to be the antidote. Yeah, I, I resonate with that because I really felt so alone for the longest time. I felt like I must be the only person out there 
like this with this kind of drinking problem because I was I was in the realm where I was like, okay, well, AA doesn't resonate for me. I don't need inpatient rehab. What do I do? It seems like I'm kind of like drinking like other people around me, but I I can't control it. I can't manage it. And it just didn't seem like there was anybody around me who felt the same way. Wow. Yeah, that is really isolating. Seems like now there's there's a lot available in social media and online, but, and people like you, you've created a community. We'll, we'll get into that for sure. But yeah, connection seems to be the antidote to some of that. Um, do you have a regular self-care practice, whether like that's a, a morning routine or maybe think about a, a weekly schedule? What does that look like for you? I would say two things that I do almost that I try to do daily. One, one is just some kind of movement, whether it's walking, going to the Y, some kind of workout is really important to me. And then I do, um, (laughs) whether to call it a nap or a meditation, (laughs) but I love my naps. I love my downtime. And I was thinking about this, like, is because you know when when I was drinking and maybe when you were drinking it was like oh I just want a way to check out I want to turn off the outside world right and so I feel like I get that when I do uh take time during the day and even could just be like 10 minutes 20 minutes where I just lay down I put I've really leveled up Arlena on this <laughs> I've my girls used to have weighted blankets and they don't use them mm. anymore. And I, so I pull out the weighted blanket. I put like a ski mask <laughs> on me. So I block out my eyes and my ears. And then I'll turn on like a, a YouTube guided meditation, body scan, or I'll just go through one myself yeah. and just lay there. And then maybe I'll fall asleep and, and it's just like the world goes quiet, everything's quiet. And then I can just get up from that and be restored, have my afternoon cup of coffee, (laughs) start my day again. Um, So if I get the opportunity to do that, it's hard when you're like working, of course, but yeah, yeah, that's really important to me. I think of that as self-care too. Oh, hundred percent. No, I, I, I remember when I was uh, doing high tech sales, you know, it was high pressure, blah, blah, blah. I would go out to my car in the parking lot and be like a crazy, you know, I just put on my shape, my sunglasses in the parking lot. I know we look like, I was like, I must look like a crazy person, but I don't actually care because if I don't sort of get that replenishment, I will actually be crazy for the rest of the day. Yeah. What like- if- Totally. One of our dietitians would do that. We would do like early morning health screenings and she'd be like, I'm just going to take like a 10 minute break nap in my car. Yeah. And she'd do that all the time. And then she'd come back totally refreshed and fine. And yeah. <laughs> yeah. I stopped, listen, I stopped caring what people think about me. Um, mostly <laughs> like when, if I needed to just do a little self-care, like it did, it just didn't matter you know, what anyone else thought, but yeah, that's a, that's like a NSDR. Uh, what does that stand for? Non-sleep deep rest. Yeah. That is actually based on yoga Nidra. Yoga Nidra. Thank you. Yes. yes. Yeah. Yeah. So just doing the body scan, just talking through each part of your body. It, it's so helpful. Yeah. I like the, uh, Andrew Huberman and the Huberman lab podcast. He talks about the yoga Nidra a lot doing the body scan. So that's a really, cause a lot of, a lot of times, like, I don't know if you get this too, but like when you're working with people who are trying to quit drinking, one of the things that inevitably comes up is I don't know how to relax. It's like they're reliant on the glass of wine at the end of the day when they're just burnt. And it's like, you know, escapism isn't necessarily a bad thing. It's or the need to escape. It's really like we're needing to recharge, but a lot of people just don't know that there are other ways of relaxing other than drinking a glass of wine at the end of the day. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's so fast and easy and you can do it with other people, right? The drinking, it makes sense. (laughs) Yeah. You can't always tap out and be like, I'm going to go do a body scan. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Right. Yeah. Comes that that has a heavy price tag. So I do not encourage that. 
as the drinking. You. Oh, yeah. no. Yeah. And it doesn't work. I mean, it works in the short term, but obviously not in the long term. No, no. I was, I uh, listened. So Huberman Lab did a really thorough, comprehensive podcast about alcohol and the effects on the body. And one of the things that I just latched onto was this idea that drinking alcohol raises your baseline of cortisol, the stress hormone when you're not drinking. So it's like people drink at the end of the day and then wake up the next morning, they're tired, hungover, whatever. And then they go throughout their day, but their cortisol is higher. So their day feels stressed more stressful. They feel tapped out. And at the end of the day, they feel the need to relax and they drink the wine again or booze or whatever. I drink at the end of the day and then the cycle starts all over. It's just total insanity. Yeah. Yeah. So boy, I drank a lot of coffee today. So <laughs> I feel like a <laughs> Maybe I need more. <laughs> man. Oh man. Um, so I named the podcast you know, the one day at a time recovery podcast, because it was something that really helped me get through those early days. Um, what does that saying mean to you? What does one day at a time mean? Yeah. Do you use it or how does yeah. that? Yeah. I love it. I think it's one of those gems from AA. So thank you, AA. <laughs> we like to <laughs> yeah. talk on it, but there's, there are definite gems from it. Yeah, I think that, I mean, it can even be one day at a time, one moment at a time, one minute at a time, especially in the early days. And I think it also reminds me of mindfulness and just mm. being in the present moment, because so often we're just either like ruminating about the past, sad about the past, anger, whatever, kind of living there. Or we're really anxious and fearful about the future. And so when we can bring it back to the present moment, then there's there's comfort and relief there because there's rarely a problem in this moment. You know, yeah. even people who are listening to this podcast right now, like I just remind you, like, you're okay. Right yeah. now, you're okay. In this moment, you're okay. And that yeah. brings me a lot of comfort. And so that's how I feel about the one day at a time, like, okay, right now, today, just focus on today. You're not going to drink today. And that's okay. We don't need to worry about your wedding <laughs> that you're going to in three months or a year, or, you know, it's just like, okay, for today, just for today. I remember when I was first getting sober, I was talking to this lady. I was like, you mean, I'm not going to be able to be able to have a glass of wine at my wedding. And she's like, are you engaged? Well, like, no. <laughs> Are you dating anybody? Well, not, not right now. She was like, what are, you, what are you talking about? Like, that's not like, don't borrow trouble. I was like, wow, I never really thought of it that way. But yeah, you're right. We're either, you know, worried about the future or sad or angry about the past. We should probably talk about how to deal with some anger because <laughs> I feel like that's some something that really is coming up for a lot of people these days. Let's talk a little bit about how we got here. Maybe you can just share, you know, I love hearing family of origin type stuff, like what your family was like growing up. And then when you started drinking. My family growing up? Well, my parents are kind of interesting because they grew up in small town Idaho and they eloped the day after my mom turned 18. <laughs> oh, ooh, that was young. Yeah, she graduated high school early. They she had her birthday April 5th. They got married April 6th. And then by the time she was 21, they had all three of us kids as siblings. <laughs> wow. Yeah, yeah. And so then we grew up in Moscow, Idaho, which is where the University of Idaho is. So big college drinking town. Uh, not a lot to do besides that. <laughs> It used to be like a badge of honor for me. I'm like, I learned to drink in Moscow. I learned to drink by going to U of I and all that. <laughs> um, but yeah, so my mom never drank growing up. My dad definitely drank, but he was more like a Coors Light, Keystone Casual. Light. Just beer. Like he was just beer and it, it was just part of his routine and he was still 
fine functioning, still it just loved his beer. And so that was never an issue growing up. Um, I think I didn't really get into drinking until like high school. Well, I started junior high, you know, sneaking ah. drinks and whatnot. <laughs> My kind of girl again. But, right. And then, um, but then high school and college was definitely party culture drinking definitely it's interesting because my mom always said you know we have alcoholism in the family you need to watch out you need to be aware of your drinking you it, it was almost like it instilled this fear in me like oh gosh what do am i going to have it am i going to be an alcoholic what's going to happen you know so i was always still like looking up like okay, what does it mean to be an alcoholic? Looking through like the checklist, like, okay, I'm okay. Whew, I'm still okay. Mm -hmm. Just constantly proving to myself, wow. like, I'm fine. I don't have that. I'm okay. I can do this. Um, so that, that part was kind of interesting and confusing. Um, my brother actually, he's T tomorrow his podcast will come out, but he's celebrating three years being alcohol free. So in my family, like my sister could take it or leave it. She's never had issues with drinking. My brother definitely had, had issues with drinking, but again, kind of more the gray area drinker like me, um, just would binge, find himself drinking too much, just wanting to undo the habit. And so we ended up like helping each other out along the way, further along than he is, but that was that was great for both of us to be a support for each other. Yeah. And yeah, so that's kind of a little bit of how it worked in my family. Yeah. So, um, you know, a lot of times people look back and be like, oh, you know, there was something where like some kind of trauma that happened that, you know, you, you sort of suppress or dissociate from. And then, you know, people have you know, issues with drinking as a coping mechanism. And then when they get sober, they look back and they go, Oh, that was, I think what was underneath the the drinking. Do you had, did you ever have a sense of what was underneath the drinking for you? I'm so glad you brought that up because I never had, like we had a good childhood. Like my parents are still married. Like I'm close with my siblings. We never had trauma growing up. And so I, it was something I was again looking for, like, okay, well, I I didn't have anything big and traumatic happen. And yet I still have a problem with drinking. And I think, I think when I, in hindsight, and the more I've learned about alcohol and whatnot is like, anybody can develop an addiction to alcohol. You know, mm -hmm. it doesn't matter if it's in your family, if you've had trauma, if you, you can have the perfect childhood, perfect marriage, perfect life, and you can still develop an addiction to alcohol. And I think that's an important message to get across because people start to wonder like, what's, what's wrong with me? I must be broken, right? But I think we can also look at alcohol like, okay, well, it makes sense that you would become addicted to this highly addictive substance. And you, I mean, that's how addiction works, like repeated exposure to something, repeated behavior. You can take anybody, put them in a room, give them enough alcohol, keep giving them alcohol, and they will become addicted. It's just, when do you reach that ceiling of addiction? And it's different for everybody. So, of course, people who have a family history of alcohol use disorder, who have had trauma, you will reach your addiction ceiling sooner than someone like who starts drinking later in life. Maybe they start drinking more after they retire and they too can develop a problem with alcohol. So I think that's one of the reasons I'm kind of passionate about what I do is just like, Hey, it's okay. Like anyone can become addicted to alcohol. 
Do you relate to the need for external validation? It was something I struggled with my entire life, always striving to improve myself so that I could achieve some goal that I thought would make me feel better. I felt like I was working so hard all the time, but I never felt like I really arrived. I would occasionally hit the wall and I would feel burned out, frustrated, and just totally discouraged. It wasn't until I learned about parts work that I was able to sort out what was going on inside, validate my own feelings, and take action that was more authentic and more in alignment with my values. The end result is that I am now more connected to my purpose and I feel more fulfilled without being burned out. Does that sound like a shift you want to make in your life? If you're ready to let go of the struggle and burnout, then you might want to consider doing parts work for yourself. To find out more, visit SoberLifeSchool.com, click on the coaching tab at the top, and book some time with me to see if parts work is right for you. Now, back to the episode. Yeah, absolutely. It's so interesting because I I feel like when you were talking, you know, what came up for me was this idea of process addiction versus physical addiction. And I feel like there is a combination of both. Like you don't necessarily have to be so addicted that you have the DTs, the delirium tremens, or, um, you know, like being shaky first thing in the morning and needing a drink to steady your hand. Um, but, but a lot of times it's like process addiction. It's like, you know, stress, some kind of stimulus of stress, triggers like the craving yeah. it's like but it's all in under the umbrella of addiction and you're right everybody is different it can be you know difficult for some people to identify that it's a problem if they haven't lost their job if they're high functioning if they're it, you know listen i had a combination of like i i knew i was a hot mess but i still had a job mm-hmm. i you know ha- had never gotten into trouble legal trouble, <laughs> partly because of my policeman boyfriend was bailing me out, but you know what I mean? It's <laughs> That's another story. <laughs> but uh, yeah, there's, if you do, you do, if you are ex- repeatedly exposed to alcohol long enough, you will develop an issue with it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, every culture that has had alcohol introduced into it have had people that develop problems with it like it doesn't matter it doesn't care where Mm -hmm. you're born what you do where you know it's just the nature of the substance and you know going back to kind of like your process addiction talk like it it is I think of it also as like a learned behavior like you have learned to use alcohol to cope to amp up good feelings you have learned that and so then it's going to take some time to unlearn the habit as well. Absolutely. How long do you think it takes somebody to unlearn that habit once they're serious? Oh, that's such a good question. I know it's it's, kind of loaded. (laughs) I know because it's hard to, because sometimes you'll hear stories of, I call them unicorns, like people who are like, I just, I read a book and I stopped and I never went back. Like people who go balls to the wall drinking and then they're so (laughs) hundred percent. I'm like, who are you? (laughs) Yeah, Because it took me decades. But I think you also, with those people, you don't really see some of the underlying thoughts that they had. Maybe they were listening to podcasts, reading books, whatnot. And so I think, gosh. Just depends, huh? I know. What do you think? I think it depends. I I interviewed this one gal who uh, claimed to have spontaneous sobriety. But yeah. upon uh, asking some more questions, I was like, bitch, you crazy. You was thinking about it for a long time. <laughs> it was, there was no nothing spontaneous about that. You know, it's like yeah. having, you know, having these repeated lessons and experience, repeated experiences that were negative and, and uh, lots of information gathering. But it was, it, I think, it, I think in some people's minds, they, this by spontaneous sobriety it's just like they're acknowledging that one day it's like post-traumatic growth. Like, you know, so the post-traumatic growth sort of refers to like an Alcoholics Anonymous, you have a rock bottom moment. And then after that, you have like this moment of clarity, right? But it's like a traumatic event happens 
And then you have this post-traumatic growth where you're just like, I can't do that. Like, that's it. Like, I cannot do this any longer. And then their behavior changes because the negative experience was so intense and so impactful that that's what did it for them. Right. Like, and I had like many of those, but I, you know, at some point, at one point I was just like, I'm never drinking again. On my, it was after my 25th birthday. I was like, I'm never doing that again. And I haven't had a Well, see, I said that so many mornings. (laughs) I know. I I did too. I'm impressed that you quit at such a young age. I'm I'm so impressed by people that do that. Girl, I just crash and burn early. That's all it was. I've heard people say that to me. And I was like, I just crash and burn early is all. Like I did not. My, but I started young too. I'm listen. I'm supposed to be interviewing you. <laughs> okay, <sorry. laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. You were asking me earlier, like, do you ever get tired of telling your own story? And I was like, absolutely not. I love talking about myself. <laughs> oh, I got to rein it in sometimes. But um, but no. So okay. So when did you you went? You said you drank for you wrestled with this for decades. Like, what were kind of what were the low moments where you're like, this is a problem. Well, I, I don't think it became, well, I should say when I was younger, I would, I knew like, okay, I, when I drink, I do go balls to the, like I was binge drinking for sure. But that was so normalized in high school and college. It is. It was after college that I'm like, I'm still doing this. (laughs) Like all your friends were like, were like mellowing out and you were still going. No, I would say they were still drinking. They definitely were. And then wine became popular and fancy. And then it became okay to drink alone because you're drinking (laughs) wine. You're so sophisticated. Um, Yeah. So I had that. And then I wouldn't say, so I would take breaks. I would sign up to do like a running race to Roby Creek. You live in Idaho. You've heard of it. (laughs) Um, So I would take a month long break and not drink and then be like, okay, I'm good. I can keep drinking. I'm fine. You know, and I did that for a long time. I would say it got really bad when the kids were young. When I have two daughters now, they're in high school, but when they were toddler, preschool age, um, I was staying home with them. I was lucky enough to do that, but I was also going crazy. (laughs) And so I was starting to drink more and more just to deal with motherhood, to deal with being alone, to deal with like my husband at work all the time. Um, And so that's when it got really bad. I would say probably around 2015 when I started like kind of putting little feelers out for getting help. (laughs) You know, I would, I, I remember I went to the Y and I got like this body composition analysis and I, I broke down in front of the trainer and I told him like, I, I drink too much. You know, I think I'm drinking too much. And, and I thought like, that was the first time I told like a stranger And I was just like, oh, my God, I said it to somebody else. What's going to happen? I thought they were going to stop me on my way out and like, (laughs) give me some pamphlets or (laughs) I just thought, what's going to happen? And nothing happened. And then the other reaction when you told him that. Um, He said, I get it. I used to eat too much. Oh, and I was like, oh, and then he started talking about his problem. (laughs) Uh, started yeah so sounds well like his happened. reaction really was he didn't know what to do with, with it right. and I think that's the reaction of a lot of people and then I I had one friend was a psychiatric nurse practitioner another and a PA at a at my OBGYN office and I told them both like okay I think I'm drinking too much My psychiatric nurse practitioner friend was like, oh, you're fine. Like, I know. And she was my drinking buddy, too. Like, she's like, you're good, you know. Uh, But I and and she did prescribe me naltrexone. So I did try naltrexone. And then my OBGYN friend was like, you're fine. I know you're fine. Like, you're because to them, this is in the medical community. Um. 
we only see people who are rock bottom. We only okay. see people who are coming in for detox, people right. who need inpatient rehab. You know, my psychiatric nurse practitioner friend was working at, at an inpatient psychiatric hospital where they do medical detox, where they do rehab, they have inpatient rehab. You know, even for me as a nurse, I started nursing at our Boise VA on the med surge unit. Mm. And some of my patient panel were veterans who were detoxing from alcohol. Okay. Yeah. And I, I was still like, I remember just being like really hungover and shaky, but like going through all the withdrawal symptoms <laughs> with them <laughs> and just thinking to myself, like, well, I'm okay. I have a job. I'm married. I, I'm I, not in the hospital. I was always comparing myself to other people and comparing myself to, to, you know, they usually were gentlemen and a lot of them were homeless or, you know, they had trauma from being in the military. I, and so I was like, that's not me. I guess I can keep on drinking. And that kept yeah. me stuck for a long time. Yeah. They say in the 12 step rooms, they say, look for the similarities, not the differences. But I think when we're sort of in that place of, you know, you're gathering, you're, you're questioning your drinking, but you're looking for the differences to justify. Yes. To keep drinking, drinking to keep drinking. Yeah. Which is understandable, but not helpful. So when did you just, was there something that ha like you've been thinking about it for a long time? What, what set you over the edge or what was the tipping point for you? I <laughs> come to the tipping point. Right. Right. I, I think it was just, it was a slow, um, change of the scales, right? It just was a slow, like alcohol was taking more than it was giving. Mm. I was feeling just more sick, more tired, more just like exhausted, trying to manage this, trying to do moderation. That was exhausting. <laughs> and I think Honestly, what finally helped me was finding these alternative ways to change your drinking. So finding Annie Grace and this naked mind, doing uh, one of her alcohol experiments, going onto a Facebook group and just seeing like, oh, there's other people out there like me. There's other people who you know, don't identify as an alcoholic. There's there's actually different medical terminology. It's alcohol use disorder. It's on a spectrum, mild to moderate to severe. I was like, oh my gosh, this is making sense. You know, because I had put it so black and white. It was just like, either you're a normal drinker or you're an alcoholic. And there was nothing in between. And now, now, thankfully, there's so much more help and resources and knowledge about this in-between period. You know, people call it gray area drinking or whatnot. So that, that really helped me change my perspective and change from just feeling like I was so broken, but I didn't know why. Again, you know, like how I was like, but I didn't have trauma. Like I had a pretty good childhood. I'm still working. Like I have kids. I have, you know, I, so it was really confusing for me. And so that, that paradigm shift to where it was like, of course you de develop an addiction to this addictive stuff. That makes sense. Of course you're using it to help cope with motherhood. Of course, you know. And so that was really helpful for me. And even just like, learning all of the facts and the science behind alcohol, which even as a nurse, I was like, what? <laughs> I know. <laughs> yeah. I mean, even your psychiatric nurse practitioner doesn't sound like I, there's a lot of in the medical community that's uh, missing from the addiction education, even if you're in it. Yeah. Me because medicine is so specialized to be fair, but yeah, there's a lot of yeah. missing information. Yeah. And, you know, it was interesting, too, because I've been working as a preventative health nurse, a wellness nurse for the last like nine years. <laughs> and our whole goal in preventative health care is to catch things before they get worse. You know, we treat pre-diabetes, pre-hypertension. We, we're trying to target 
these kind of conditions before it progresses to a heart attack or a stroke or worse, right? We don't do that with addiction in medicine. Oh, the irony. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it is, isn't it? It really is. But yeah, I mean, listen, life is hard. I get that people, you know, use drinking as a coping skill and it's pushed on us at every opportunity. So it is confusing, right? It is a little bit confusing to be fair. Yeah. So um, what if you, okay, let's, I, I do want to ask you, there were two things that came up for me. Did you ever go back to that nurse practitioner and just be like, Hey, just so you know, <laughs> you, you don't have to be in the fucking nut ward to have a problem with alcohol. Like <laughs> Just no. FYI, if somebody comes to you as a professional, like maybe you should update your information. Yeah, no, no I didn't. Maybe you should. <laughs> right. I just have like this bone to pick with the medical community. It, it, it uh, you know, listen, I'm 300 and, you know, 25 episodes in, and it just astonishes me how often people go to their doctor and the doctor's all, nah, you're good. Yeah. Uh, this is a, this is a reoccurring theme. Yeah. Or a counselor, even or a counselor. A counselor. Yeah. yeah. So-called professionals. There's just so such little education. Um, okay. So um, the other thing I wanted to ask was what, so how did you had a lot, lots of information. What did you start doing different once you decided, like, how did you decide that I need to be abstinent? And, and like, what was, what did you start doing? That's such a good question. Cause I really tried to moderate for so long. Yeah, I, I was always looking for like, oh, the magic pill to moderation. Mm -hmm. I thought that naltrexone, when she prescribed me naltrexone, I'm like, this is it. I can drink Does that. Does that reduces cravings? Is that true? It's it's designed to reduce cravings. And then if you do drink, you don't get as much of the the effect. Okay. The positive, like buzzy effect. Okay. Which for me, I mean, it kind for a lot of people, it does help. Okay. Um, for me though, I would just be frustrated and keep trying to drink more. Like I'm not feeling it. I want to feel it. <laughs> so it ended up not being for me, but uh, for a lot of people, it's a game changer. Mm -hmm. I've heard that too. Mm -hmm. What was and your game changer? Good. Oh gosh. Oh, so you were asking, how did I get to the point where I was done? So I think, so I found Annie Grace and this kind of alternative way of changing oh. your drinking in 2018, 2019, I feel like that was my year of breaking up with alcohol mm -hmm. and just having more and more alcohol free days versus drinking days and just learning still learning more about the health effects of alcohol. And I think by the time I got to the end of 2019, I was like, okay, I think I'm done. I've had enough. I'd rather have none than one. I'm done. And so that for me was a relief, actually, making yeah. the decision because I, I rode that fence line for so long. Um, so once I could finally make the decision, like abstinence is just easier. It's just so much easier. There's a saying like, a hundred percent is bliss, ninety nine percent's a bitch. <laughs> and that's that's how I felt about moderation. I was like, this is taking so much bandwidth and chatter and mental space in my head to try to have two drinks on a Friday night. This isn't worth it. Yeah. Yeah, that's the old sick and tired of being sick and tired. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, so true. Okay, so then you quit. You decided like that was it. You you were just done. And what happened after that? Well, it was 2020. So <laughs> then COVID hit and the world oh. changed, yeah. which was actually a gift for me because I would do okay with not drinking for a while in those other years prior to 2020, but I would get back on it anytime, like if there was a bachelorette party or a birthday or my parents were busy, whatever. If there was something social, it would kind of send me back down 
my drinking path again to where I would eventually go back to daily drinking. Mm -hmm. And because we were so isolated and nothing was happening, we weren't socializing. That was a gift for me because I could just, I was just getting more and more sober days, just maintaining my momentum. And, and I think getting those longer stretches is so helpful when you're changing your drinking. So getting your 30 days and then your 60 and then 90, you know, and then I was like, okay, I'm going to get to a year. And so that was really, really helpful for me. I I know we do Mm -hmm. not want to go back to COVID again. (laughs) No, but there's a lesson in taking a break socially, if that's your trigger. Yeah, absolutely. And that kind of leads me to um, kind of what I wanted to talk to you. We were talking about different kinds of topics. And I think that, you know, I, I would love to hear like um, what you think and, you, and you're and you a coach and you, and you work with women. Do you work with men too? Yeah. Everybody. Okay. So when you work with people who are trying to quit, there are some pretty common mistakes that happen early in recovery, um, what, what comes to mind when you think of maybe some of the typical mistakes people make early in recovery? Um, well, I, I, I honestly look at it differently, I think, than a lot of people in that I'm not about perfection. I'm about helping people practice, not drink. And so I think of mistakes as like learning points. Or yeah. data points. Yeah. I, I think it can be a mistake early on to be so perfectionist and then you slip up and then you end up just beating yourself up and then saying, fuck it. <laughs> right. Like, we all well, get the case of the fuck it's now and again. <laughs> totally. Totally. <laughs> um, so I think that that can be hard on people. That can be a mistake. So perfectionism would be the mistake there. I think so. I hesitate okay. to even label things as mistakes. I just feel yeah. like people learn from them. Yeah, I think a can, mistake. Yeah. yeah. I think then maybe a mistake would be beating yourself up. Yeah. I think that, I think that does no one no help. I mean, yeah. if it did, if you beat yourself up and shamed yourself, we wouldn't even need to have our podcasts <laughs> or coaching or anything, right? It just doesn't work. So I think that's a mistake, I guess yeah. you could say. Yeah. yeah. I always tell people you can't hate yourself well. Yeah. It just totally. Work. Totally. Yeah. Okay. So it's so funny. I think it was um, The Way of the Peaceful Warrior by Dan Millman. He had this, I think it was the rules for hu- being human came from that. And one of the rules was there are no mistakes, there are only lessons. And a lesson is repeated until it's learned. And we have evidence that we've learned a behavior, uh, we've learned a lesson by change in behavior. That's oh, how we know that. that we've, isn't that good? Yeah. yeah. There is a whole bunch of other ones like there is no that like there is no better than here because once you get there you just discover a new there and then you're just always looking forward yeah there is yeah. a bunch of them that's definitely worth uh doing a little google uh rules for being human um what about what about getting help like i feel like i suffered alone much longer than i needed to yeah i i think that having other people that get it is key and finding that wherever works for you trying on different groups different you know if if you want to try aa try it go ahead be open and be curious about <laughs> it right and get arlena's book on <laughs> Yeah. That's a little hyper skeptic. Right. <laughs> or navigate. try different, try a different online group. Try smart recovery. Try, you know, even or celebrate recovery. There's she yeah, recovers there's, for there's women. There's so many. And so, so no many, recognizing yeah. like you don't have to do it alone. Yeah. I think is is so helpful. Don't do it alone. Um, what about socializing? I've found that, um, it's so important to like have an exit strategy or have a buddy, a support buddy. Um, 
What are some of the mistakes you see people making when it comes to socializing? Well, I think one, and this is kind of like a general mindset thing, but a lot of times people are focusing so much on what they're giving up (laughs) and what they're losing and like, oh, you know, instead of focusing on what they're getting, instead of focusing on like, okay, let's romanticize sobriety, not drinking, let's date (laughs) let's date sobriety. Let's have, you know, so for a social event, it's like, instead of thinking, oh my God, how much is this going to suck? Like really (laughs) challenge yourself to think like, okay, how can I make this more fun? How can I make this easier? What can I do? And, And just like you were sharing, like, okay, have an exit plan, have a buddy, but maybe do something to make it fun. Like get a new outfit, right? Get it. Yeah. Have, have your dessert. Go shopping. <laughs> <laughs> right. Have something to look forward to at the end of your night. Have, oh. you know, yeah, just, you know, just really focusing on the That's benefits and the treats for staying alcohol free, maybe having something the next morning that you're looking forward to doing so that you don't feel so deprived. I think a lot of times we're like, oh, I'm giving this up. Life is over. You know, (laughs) it's like, no, like this is a gift. Being alcohol free is a gift. It's a gift you're giving to your mental health, to your physical health. It's a gift even for your family and your friends. Like it, it's a good thing that you're doing. It is a really good thing that you're doing. A hundred percent. And you know, it kind of makes me think, um, another thing, that's kind of a mistake is not planning for boredom. Do you find, Mm. did you find that when you were early sober that you were bored a little bit? Yeah, that's something common you hear a lot. And that was back in the pandemic too, when we were all like ordering paint by numbers and doing puzzles (laughs) and just going back to board games and things you like to do when you were a kid. And yeah, that's a good one. What did you like to do when you were little? Yeah, yeah. And you see people tap into that again and again. And you see people tapping more into like their creativity, into music, into movement, exercise, just into all these other areas of their lives that just got neglected. Because before, I mean, really drinking is boring, right? Just sitting (laughs) on your couch watching Netflix and drinking. (laughs) It's pretty boring, <laughs> unless you have yeah. a really good Netflix show. <laughs> yeah, yeah, all the artificial dopamine. Well, and listen, um, that was one of the things I learned about when people are healing from alcohol is that your brain is so accustomed to being flooded with dopamine that your brain actually removes the dopamine receptors on the wall of the cell, so you actually cannot absorb too much dopamine so that when you stop drinking, like your body as a self-protection mechanism doesn't allow you to absorb. So like that's the boredom is a sign of healing. Actually, Mm. it takes a little bit of time for your body to put those receptors back out so that they can receive the dopamine and you can start feeling good. So I always tell people prepare for the boredom, but it's just know that it's only temporary. I think 30, 60 days, you know, your brain starts to heal and things start becoming more enjoyable again, but prepare for the boredom. Yeah. Yeah. And also, um, I had read somewhere that it's day 14, that your dopamine's at the lowest. Okay. And then it starts to come back up and it makes sense because usually, you know, when people are taking a break, doing 30 day month, 30 day months, (laughs) (laughs) I know what you mean. Oh, that's right. Okay. 30 day months. Yeah. Yeah. When people like you start to lose motivation midway and that makes sense because dopamine is also the neurotransmitter for motivation. So it's like, okay, hang in there because then you're going to start, your brain is healing and it's going to start naturally resetting and making dopamine and serotonin to the point where even just ordinary, ordinary small things give you pleasure. Things that never used to give you pleasure are now like, oh, like entertaining (laughs) or or beautiful or just random stuff. 
Seriously, I remember early days in sobriety, like going for walks and being like, oh my God, the trees are so green and the birds sound so amazing. I was like, that that makes sense. Yeah, that was one of the early stages. I kind of forgot about that. That's yeah, really it's just like the fog is lifting. <laughs> it's just literally yeah. like, oh my gosh, wow. <laughs> literally the fog is lifting. Yeah. And you think about it too, like, what do they say? Like 80% of your serotonin, I don't know if this is true, but a lot of your serotonin is produced in your gut. And when you're flooding your gut with alcohol, it disrupts the production of serotonin. So that's healing too. Yeah. You're healing your whole body. And I mean, it's pretty amazing. Our, our bodies are so resilient and you see people like even just 30 days without drinking, like your blood pressure lowers, your heart rate lowers, you see, you can see improved liver function tests and cholesterol. And, you know, it's just like your, your body is just like, thank you. (laughs) But I think it's funny. We yeah. saw that we saw that in COVID too. Like, remember the seeing those pictures of like congested cities um that oh, were yeah. super remember they were like super polluted and then everybody went on lockdown and COVID and like nature was healing itself. Mm-hmm. It's like the animals came back, the air got clear. It's like we're part of nature too. It's interesting. Our brains work the same way. That was really trippy. Well, and I think it's hopeful too. And, yeah. and, you know, going back to the brain, they, they used to think that our brain was just like fixed and concrete and couldn't change or heal. But now we know like, oh no, it's pliable, it can heal. You know, you can restore your neurotransmitters. You can, you, you know, return to normal or as close to normal. Of course, it depends on like, how heavy you've been drinking or whatnot, but, but (laughs) there is this return to baseline return to normal. And I think that is, is very hopeful for people. Yeah. I also found that when I found my community, I kind of found a new normal, right? Like I found people who were also struggling the same way I did, which was so comforting to just know we're not alone in those the way we think is a little bit different. Like the crazy thoughts that we have, it's like, (laughs) it's it's a new normal. Yeah. Because not everybody gets it. No, (laughs) maybe that's a mistake is expecting. I I hear people be like, Oh, you know, I told my family, I told my friends and they didn't get it. You know, it just makes you feel more isolated. So maybe, maybe another mistake we can add is um, expecting everybody to support you or get it. Absolutely. Did you have people in your life who were not supportive or who didn't get it that you were, you were disappointed? I I would say had people who didn't get it for sure. Um, I was lucky I had a lot of support. My husband was really supportive. Nice. He doesn't get it. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> he would sometimes say you have like the best willpower of anyone I know like he thinks I'm still running off of willpower I'm like no yeah. oh, that's cute <laughs> <laughs> yeah so I definitely had people that didn't understand it um it was interesting because I always talk with one of my nursing friends and she's struggled with food for a long time and she was talking about um well, we were having a conversation with after the Oprah Ozempic. Ooh. After the Oprah Ozempic episode. I don't know if people watched it, but honestly, there's people were so pissed many, after that. <laughs> well, there's so many parallels between over drinking and overeating and then the yes, mental chatter and whatnot. And my drinking, we didn't really get into it, but my drinking and my drinking breaks, a lot of it was tied to my mm, disordered eating. I wouldn't say you have eating a little... disorder, but disordered oh, okay. eating for sure. That okay. was so you're all on the tied spectrum. Together. Yeah, you're on the spectrum of disordered eating, but you wouldn't consider it a. Yeah, I okay. was. Yeah, for sure. Like That's I had fair. episodes of which what could be considered anorexia, and then okay. bulimia, and then binging and purging, and all yeah. of that, but nothing extreme. Um, but it was also very, <laughs> you're like, that sounds pretty extreme. I mean, I've never <laughs> once been able to 
vomit on command or whatever. <laughs> so just saying. Took a little more than on command. Yeah. Or but yeah. No, yeah. Yeah. It was really I tight. don't mean to I I feel like I'm let me just clarify that I, that's not my area of expertise. I don't mean to minimize or Oh no, no. Yeah. I I it's I just like, like had this voice going, that was really shitty. You probably shouldn't say that. No, no, no. But okay. I think it's interesting because I kind of feel like, oh, don't, doesn't every woman get it? Doesn't every woman have this diet chatter? My body sucks. Mental yeah, my body sucks. Everybody has that. Thread going through. Yeah. yeah. 100%. 100%. So I it think... made me think, yeah, it made me think about my friend who was like, I I said, I watched that Oprah and this woman was talking about being on Ozempic and how it turned the chatter down in her head about when to eat, what am yeah. I going to eat, um, all of that obsessiveness. Mm -hmm. And I said, that sounded to me so much like the drinking voice in my head. And my friend was like, that's what the voice in my head is like my eating voice. Like it's just oh, these chatter, this mental chatter in your head, this kind of obsessive compulsive chatter in your head that's related to whatever your thing is, whether that's drinking or eating. Yeah, no, that's, I mean, the obsession, they talk about the obsession a lot in 12 step rooms. And I feel like, you know, the, I think the reason why the 12 steps have been adapted to so many different things Mm. it's because we do get that it's an, you know, it's an avoidance of self it's escapism, but it's like escape from that chatter that, yeah. that's, you know, and I think that's why prayer meditation is, you know, incorporated into that because it, that does calm down the chatter, but I, I'm a huge fan of the, what are they, what, what's the generic term? Like they're like peptides, peptide blockers, or what is it called? For, the, oh, semi-glutide. Uh, no, well, just the class of drugs in general or like some kind of blocker. I've done semi-glutide, terrors, what's the oh, other one? The big are you team? talking about kind of the Ozempic type of drugs? Yeah, what's the class? Yeah, called? I think it's like a GLP. <gasps> Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, peptide. they're actually <laughs> doing research to see if those may be good for alcohol use disorder. Yeah. To help with the mental chatter. That's what I'm hearing. The cravings. Yeah. It, it, it's been helping cravings. I've been hearing that a lot. Really interesting. Yeah. I'm a fan. I'm a fan. I use them to like till I get to my goal weight and then I go off for a period of time. And then but it, it's so interesting because um for me it's the food cravings. Well, and to go back to when you're talking about like what made me successful and what mistakes yeah. are, yeah, yeah. and yeah. they're kind of tied together. I think I'm a what made me successful was also untying weight loss and drinking because a lot of the times I went on those um, month long dry breaks, especially when I was young and running, I mm. went on them to lose weight oh. and so to prove to myself like, oh, you can keep drinking. But it was like, I want to, I want to, you know take a break from drinking so I can lose weight. It was very, very tied together. Interesting. Yeah. So once I was able, once I got serious about the drinking, it was almost like I had to decide, do you want to be thin or do you want to be sober? Oh, and to me, yeah. it became more important to be sober, to be alcohol free. So I took dieting off the table. Okay. And that really helped me like, okay, you're not drinking. You can have the ice cream. You can have some pasta. And before I would try to do both. And so I think that can be a mistake for people when they're trying to change their drinking, whether they're taking a break or just done with drinking. A lot of people try to tie it with weight loss. And mm. I think that, that that can be a mistake because so much of our drinking cravings are actually hunger cravings. And so if we're depriving ourselves of alcohol, of the dopamine, and then we're not eating enough calories, we're depriving ourselves of food, we have low blood sugar. So when we have low blood sugar, we're going to get hangry. <laughs> 
and we're going to have cravings. So it's like, eat. I don't care what you eat, especially in the beginning. You can focus on weight later, but just, you know, focus on not drinking today. And that's going to help your weight and your metabolism and your body in the long term. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, that. Yeah. That That's brilliant. That me. is brilliant. That like really hit the nail on the head for me in a lot of ways. I always tell people, uh, especially if I'm coaching them to stop drinking is to make sure they have uh, protein snacks on hand. Yeah. Yep. So definitely. especially in the afternoon. Yeah. The witching hour, move <laughs> your, <laughs> move your lunch or move your lunch up, move your dinner up, like eat earlier, eat earlier. Yeah. M- I always make sure you have yeah. snacks. Absolutely. Lots, lots of protein. I think in general, we don't get enough protein. I find that it's hard, you know, to get enough protein in my body just regularly, you know, yeah. but, but especially it's especially important because it's so tied to mood management. Yeah, because it helps stabilize your blood sugar. Yeah, yeah, don't <laughs> and, get hangry. <laughs> yeah, but I think, you know, it's okay, especially in those first weeks, that first month, like it's okay to have Skittles or donuts yeah, or yeah. that's okay. That's okay. A hundred percent. You know, back in the olden days when people would show up to AA meetings and they would have the j- jitters, people used to, uh, we, this is before the spin dry era, you know, like, do you refer to rehabs as spin dry? No. Okay. That's <laughs> Never what they, heard of that. <laughs> yeah. They call them spin dries. Um, but before the days of like rehab, people used to carry candy bars and hand them out at meetings because people would, because the sugar, mm. you know, the, the, it had something to do with the sugar, but it would help steady people's nerves, steady the hand instead of you know, yeah, before rehab is as gnarly. And people didn't eat it's so funny the judgment people have now, especially from the 12 step community, um, is that that people um oh my god, I'm losing my train of thought. I think I didn't eat breakfast, too much coffee and not enough protein. <laughs> but people used to um yeah, we used to have to carry candy bars and and hand those out to people so that I, they could. But a lot of this is like mood management. A lot of early recovery is learning how to emotion management type of thing. So mm-hmm. that kind of makes me think of another thing, which is um, identifying triggers. Like, I think it's really, I think it's a mistake early in recovery, not to be honest about what triggers your drinking. Do you remember the kinds of things that would trigger your drinking? Um, well, I find like triggers are a little complicated because I felt like I, anything could trigger my drink. Oh. <laughs> it was like, I drink because I'm stressed. I drink because it's vacation. I drink because it's a birthday. I drink because I'm angry. I drink because I'm anxious. It was like, everything felt like a trigger, <laughs> right? Yeah. <laughs> and so when everything feels like a trigger, well, then what? And right. <laughs> but yeah, definitely identifying. I think with all of those, I think what is helpful is to like identify the feeling that you're having and pause, take stock, and then make a decision. I think what happens is we get the cue, the trigger, the feeling, and then we just automatically drink because we've learned yeah. that. We've learned that so fast. So automatically we drink. So it's like, oh, how do we make more space between the cue, the trigger, whatever, and the response? And so we were kind of talking about mindfulness before, like that is one way to do it. Mm -hmm. And the other simple way, and I don't know if HALT came from AA or not, but I love the HALT acronym. I find that so helpful always. What, like, and what is it? Would you like to show what it is? <laughs> halt. Halt. And just stop. <laughs> halt. Um, so it stands for, are you hungry? And we talked a lot about the low blood sugar, right? If you, a lot of times we're just hungry. Mm-hmm. So eat something, maybe drink something. A lot of times we're dehydrated and that can mimic hunger as well. Right. Right. So right. Are you hungry? The A is, are you anxious? Are you agitated? Are you angry? Angry. Yeah. Right. Any of those A words, right? 
And so what can you do to address that? Maybe you need to phone a friend. Maybe you need to go on a walk. Maybe you have time to do some deep breathing, something like that. The L is, are you lonely? And I feel like that came back so much to our talk too, like Mm -hmm. feeling so alone. So how can you connect? What would that look like? And maybe it's not even a human. Maybe it's an animal. (laughs) Maybe it's a pet. Maybe it's something that's just making you feel more connected to the world. And then the T is for tired. Maybe you're just tired. And, and again, you can have a big old glass of water and that will, dehydration can make you feel tired. Yeah. If you don't, if you can't sleep or rest, do your 10 minute um, car, (laughs) car nap, even just a walk or movement or splashing water on your face, just addressing those things in halt, I think is so helpful And then you've slowed yourself down enough where then you can make a decision instead of just being on autopilot. Because so much of our drinking habits are autopilot. We're just, we have learned so fast to just, oh, drinking will solve that. (laughs) Oh, I'll have a drink. I'll feel better right away. Yeah, absolutely. Slowing that down. So funny. I used to say uh, before I knew what halt meant, I thought it meant hormones, assholes, losers, and twats. (laughs) That was my sugar. <laughs> maybe no, it does. no, that's not it. That, yeah. Maybe that's the A. That makes sense. That could <laughs> all go in the A. <laughs> Another A word for you. There you go. Well, a yeah. lot of times we're just drinking at people. Oh, right. For sure. We're just drinking at an emotion. Like, and who are we showing? Really, like I'll show them. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's so interesting. So in 12 step, they use the A is anger. And because there is this emphasis that anger is such a destructive emotion, right? Mm. The, uh, and you know, that's when like they do the four step, they start with resentments. Mm. You know, they say that resentments are the number one cause of relapse. You know, it's that anger. Like some of us are just not qualified to handle anger. Although I don't agree with that hundred percent. There is a lot of truth to that. Anger is such a destructive emotion. Yeah. I, w- I was going to say like, I try not to think of emotions as like good or bad. They're just messengers, right? Even yes. anger is trying to tell us something. And yeah, it's interesting. Tara Brock um, talks about anger as being a sign of an unmet need. Yeah. That's so much more compassionate, right? perspective on yeah on and it's it's anger. a normal emo I mean <laughs> yeah they all are like we we don't have to categorize them as good or bad I actually yeah, just feel went to shitty see, oh I know right <laughs> I just went to see inside out too over oh, the did weekend. You? Yeah. it I mean they're so good for showing our emotions and how they're trying to protect us they introduced new emotions and inside out too they have anxiety and embarrassment and envy and then one was ennui like kind of ennui like like you don't care kind of Ah. apathy kind of Ah. like you're too cool because this is her (laughs) in puberty Oh. But they're all, but all the emotions are all trying to protect the girl. Yeah. They're trying to protect Riley. And I, so it just, I just try to view emotions differently instead of trying to like resist them or be afraid of them. And yeah. And even cravings and urges are emotions. So just yeah. like, oh, again, like, what is this trying to tell me? And then you can go through the halt, like, oh, this makes sense. Yeah. Are you familiar with uh, internal family systems? Yeah, a little bit. And I think you oh had my talked gosh. about it. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, yeah, I, there's a, a couple of really good interviews with Dick Schwartz. Tim Ferriss has one where they do a demo. Oh, um, Rich cool. Roll also has one where they do a demo with Dick Schwartz. But it's all, and they do talk about addiction as, you know, that there is a part of you that's trying to save you from emotions that you don't know how to process to resolution that we can't tolerate. Right. And I feel like that's a lot of what the coping mechanism is. It's like a survival skill. There's an emotion that we don't know how to resolve. 
or deal with or process. So we repress it and, but it, 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 it always comes out. So yeah, internal family systems is a very compassionate way to look at those feelings of anxiety or anger or yeah. even the addiction. Yeah. Well, I mean, it makes sense because we, our brain is trying to protect us and we're hardwired. We're hardwired to move towards pleasure and away from pain in the quickest way possible. And so our, we have learned that alcohol does that. Yes. And so now it's like, oh, how do I unlearn that? Like, cause it's causing me more pain and less pleasure. And how do I undo this? Yeah. And listen, we can definitely rewire our brain. Um, and I do want to ask you a little bit about what life is like now. And I want to give you a chance to sort of talk about your coaching program. Cause you do coaching, you do help people to quit drinking, but it's like, what's the benefit of quitting? Like, what has your life been like? You know, what is it that you're trying to pass along to your clients? Well, I, I think that sobriety is like a sparkle pill, <laughs> Isn't it? Oh, I, that's so cute. Yeah. I just is. think that it's like so much brighter and happier and easier <laughs> and more colorful and all those good things. I really try to lean into the positive. I mean, life's still life, right? I still have the same husband and kid <laughs> and <laughs> whom you love, <laughs> whom I adore. But adore. it's um I'm just better able to handle whatever life is throwing at me without drinking at it. Cause I used to just drink at it and that didn't like solve anything. And now I'm just like raw dog in life. (laughs) I love that expression. Easier. Yeah. But you just have a whole different set of tools. Like you're able to regulate your emotions, but you have new tools and new friends and yeah a, new, yeah, a new purpose. You got the podcast, like you're helping people. Yeah. I mean, I'm not perfect and I'm not like happy all the time. That's for oh, sure. Oh, you're still human. <laughs> I'm a human walking around in a meat suit on this planet Earth, but I am just enjoying it more yeah. than I ever thought I would. And I, I feel just so grateful and I... I I love what I do and I love being here and helping people like that does definitely give me meaning and purpose and oh. it's it's just an honor to be a part of the sober sober curious community. Yeah. I'm so glad that I get to do that. But mostly I'm so grateful I get to be here for my family and yeah. really show up for them in a way that is authentic and helpful. I hope yeah, yeah. I do have teenagers now and that is a whole new <laughs> a whole new ball game but there are so many nights things happen with teens as you know where I'm like thank god I'm sober <laughs> oh yeah trust me oh my goodness yeah I'm on the other side of it I'll just give you a little hope it does get better thank my you. boys are in there <laughs> I got one that's 23 and one that's 20 it does get it does get better but uh, it's, you're right. Being sober allows you to be able to handle the challenges that are going to come up, no matter whether you're drinking or sober. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, where can people find you? You can find me at Alcohol Tipping Point. So I'm on Instagram at Alcohol Tipping Point. I have a podcast that Arlena was on. I have a website called alcoholtippingpoint.com. And I have lots of free resources there. I run um, monthly dry groups. I call them alcoholidays. <laughs> and so That's I've been awesome. doing that for like three years now. So I just want to make a safe, non-judgmental space for people to practice not drinking because I know that it takes time to get to the point where you you're done with alcohol. And I know that there is this period in between where you're like, am I done? Am I not? I'm not sure. And so I just want to encourage people like, if you're not sure, take a break, see what it's like without alcohol, get some tools and resources and support, be with other people who get this and who can help support you. 
and then you can decide, you know, it, it took me years to finally be done with drinking. And so I think it's important to have spaces where you can practice not drinking when you don't really know yet. And then, then you're just kind of starting to tip the scales again to where like, oh, I actually like being alcohol free more than drinking. I like sobriety more than drinking. And then that feels like real freedom once you finally make that decision for yourself, not for anybody else, where you decide like, okay, I'm done. I'm done with drinking and I'm ready to be alcohol free. Yeah, that is a process for sure. And it's nice to have a safe space. You seem like a very safe person. I hope, I hope so. <laughs> yes. Yes. You give the vibe very safe, non-judgmental. That is so important. I feel like that's our job is support people is to create a safe environment because when people feel safe, that's when their guard comes down. That's when the truth comes up and that's when, when we can be honest and that's when the change happens. Yeah, definitely. And yeah. I'm, I'm a huge proponent of the self-compassion and self-kindness as you're navigating this. Yeah, hundred percent. Well, my dear, I didn't think I was going to take you right up to the very hour that you had to go, but thank you so much. For- I'm so glad we did. I feel yeah. like we could touch on a lot of stuff. We could keep on covered a lot of ground, but we'll have to. You'll have to come back for round two. We'll have to do some more of these, or or something. We'll do some Absolutely. more stuff. Or the self help junkie. I guess yeah. I am one too. I love that yeah. idea. That's so helpful. Yeah. Let's do that. That'll be that'll be fun. So I'll make announcements. Uh, now that you've committed, you're on the hook. So let's okay, do it. <laughs> let's do it. Do, do right. we like pick a book and then go through pick a book, a podcast, uh, just okay. an idea? So I love we'll, it. We'll talk offline. We'll come up with an idea, and uh, we'll do the self help junkie podcast. Yay. Okay, fun. That sounds fun. Thank you. All right, my dear. It was good being with you today. Thank you so much. Thank you. One last thing before you go, you can follow the podcast on Instagram for daily inspiration at ODAT Podcast. And if you'd like to get a bi-weekly email from me with recommendations to books I'm reading, meditations I love, or other recovery podcasts, just sign up for it at odatchat.com. That's O-D-A-A-T chat.com. And if you do, I hope you enjoy it.